Vaso motion is the term that refers to the changing of a blood vessel's diameter, either vasodilation or vasoconstriction. And vaso motion has a couple of important functions. One we've already talked about, which is regulating the blood pressure. <clears throat> we can dilate blood vessels to bring the blood pressure down. We can constrict blood vessels to bring the blood pressure up. A second important function of vasomotion is to regulate blood flow to different areas of the body. So we can either dilate blood vessels to bring more blood to certain areas of the body, or we can constrict blood vessels to bring less blood to certain areas of the body. An example of this would be to look at how blood flow patterns change when you're at rest compared to when you're active. So when you're just resting, close to half of your cardiac output, half of the blood coming out of your heart, is directed to your digestive system and to your urinary system. This is important because when you're resting, most of your body's energy are going towards getting nutrients and getting rid of wastes. Only about 20% of your blood flow ends up going to your skeletal muscles because you're not moving very much so they don't need very much energy. If we look at what happens when you begin exercising, we see a change in this blood flow pattern. So the amount of blood that goes to your digestive system goes down to about 25%. Only a quarter of your blood goes to the digestive and kidneys, and almost half of your blood ends up going to your skeletal muscles. We dilate the blood vessels in the skeletal muscle to bring more blood there, and constrict the blood vessels in the viscera and the um, digestive and urinary systems to reduce the amount of blood flow going there. This provides our muscles with the oxygen and the nutrients they need to carry out more activity. We also see an increase in blood going to the skin, and that's important for being able to cool off. As you're more active and your body's creating more heat, we send more blood to the skin to allow cooling. This effect is even more dramatic if we look at what happens with maximum exercise when nearly three quarters of your cardiac output is going to your skeletal muscles and a small amount, less than 10%, is going to the digestive system and, and urinary system. That's because when you're working very hard, you don't need to be wasting time digesting food or peeing, you want all of your energy going to the muscles. Now the way we obtain regulation of vasomotion is through several different mechanisms. We're going to be looking at what happens with local control of vasomotion, what happens with neural control, signals from the brain, and what happens with hormonal control. Let's start with local control. Local control of vasomotion is very important for regulating blood flow to specific small areas of the body. This is going to help us get more blood to tissues that need more blood right now and less blood to tissues that don't need as much blood right now. Because we're looking at local areas, this does not affect the total peripheral resistance and therefore does not really affect the blood pressure. This is only affecting blood flow to different areas. When we're looking at local control of vasomotion, we're looking at signals that indicate whether a tissue needs more blood flow or not. We've actually looked at these before. When we were looking at the precapillary sphincters on the arterioles, and they open when you need more blood to a certain capillary bed, and they close when you don't. The same signals that control those precapillary sphincters are the signals that control the dilation or constriction of the arterioles and small arteries in that area. The sorts of things we talked about that indicate that a tissue needs more blood flow would be things like low oxygen level, um, uh, low pH or high CO2 or higher temperature. All of those indicate that a tissue needs more blood flow. All of those trigger the smooth muscle in the arteries and arterioles to relax so that the arterial dilates and we bring more blood to that area of the tissue. If a tissue has plenty of oxygen and it's not building up a lot of carbon dioxide and it's relatively cool, then we allow the constriction of the blood vessels in those areas to bring less blood flow to the areas that need less blood flow. When we're looking for more of a whole body effect, when we're trying to affect blood pressure, for example, then it's important to look at neural control. Vasomotion is controlled from a vasomotor center in the medulla oblongata of the brain. 
The vasomotor center, the medulla oblongata of the brain, receives information from the body, and then it determines if we need to increase or decrease the blood pressure. This is similar to the cardiac center that we saw in the medulla oblongata of the brain, with one big difference. The vasomotor center of the brain only controls sympathetic neurons. We can either activate sympathetic neurons in the vasomotor center. Activating these is going to send signals down to the viscera, to the digestive and the urinary organs, and it's going to cause vasoconstriction to help raise the blood pressure. Or we can inhibit sympathetic neurons in the vasomotor center. That's going to send fewer signals down to the viscera, to the blood vessels in the digestive system and the urinary system. That allows them to dilate and brings the blood pressure down. It's important to note that the vasomotor center in the medulla oblongata only sends signals to the viscera, to your abdominal and pelvic organs. It doesn't affect the skeletal muscle. So when we're talking about neuroregulation of vasomotion through the vasomotor center, you need to just think about what's happening in the viscera, not about what's happening in the skeletal muscles. One of the important signals that goes to the vasomotor center is coming from the baroreceptors. We talked about baroreceptors before. These are stretch receptors that allow us to detect the blood pressure in the aorta and in the internal carotid arteries. These baroreceptors detect the level of blood pressure in the aorta and the carotid arteries and send signals to the vasomotor center. When your blood pressure is too high, the baroreceptor signals go to the vasomotor center and they inhibit the sympathetic neurons that are going to your viscera. When we inhibit those sympathetic neurons, that's going to allow dilation of the blood vessels and your blood pressure is going to come down. At the same time this is happening, remember those baroreceptors are also sending signals to the cardiac center. In the cardiac center, they activate the parasympathetic neurons that slow down the heart rate so that you reduce cardiac output and you lower the blood pressure that way as well. So the baroreceptors send their signals to the cardiac center and to the vasomotor center and use both of those to reduce the blood pressure. On the other hand, if your blood pressure is too low, the baroreceptors can detect that and they send signals up to the vasomotor center to activate the sympathetic neurons. We activate the sympathetic neurons to cause constriction of the blood vessels in the viscera and that's going to help increase resistance and raise the blood pressure. Recall that at the same time, those baroreceptors are sending signals to the cardiac center in the brain. And in the cardiac center of the brain, we are going to be activating sympathetic neurons as well to increase the heart rate and increase the contractility so that we get more cardiac output. And that will also raise the blood pressure. When we were talking about what affects the heart rate, we also discussed the chemoreceptors. Remember that there are chemoreceptors that detect the pH and the oxygen and CO2 levels in the aorta and the carotid arteries. And these also send signals to the vasomotor center. Remember that the chemoreceptors are detecting the levels of oxygen and CO2 and the pH right there in the aorta and the carotid artery, right when the blood is coming back from the lungs and about to go out to the body. When we measure the level of oxygen and CO2 in that blood, it gives us an indication of whether we're getting adequate blood flow and adequate exchange in the lungs. So if we see a low level of oxygen or a high level of CO2, what that indicates is we need more blood flow to the lungs. The best way to get more blood flow to the lungs is to raise the blood pressure so we can get more blood going to the lungs. So when we detect low level of oxygen or high level of carbon dioxide in the chemoreceptors, the chemoreceptors send signals up to the vasomotor center to activate sympathetic neurons so that we get vasoconstriction in the viscera and we can raise the blood pressure so we're pushing more blood to the lungs. This is the opposite of what happens with local regulation of vasomotion. Remember that with local vasomotion, then when you had low levels of oxygen or high CO2, we needed to dilate blood vessels to increase blood flow to that area. When we're looking at the whole body with the chemoreceptors, we need a different response. So it's important to keep those two mechanisms straight. Besides neuroregulation, if we want to have whole body effects on vasomotion and blood pressure, we can also look at endocrine regulation, where there are hormones 
that are going to help regulate vasomotion. One hormone that affects the blood vessel diameter is epinephrine. Epinephrine, remember, is released by the adrenal glands and it acts in a way similar to the sympathetic nervous system and that it's preparing the body for activity. Epinephrine causes dilation of the blood vessels in the skeletal muscles, so we've got more blood to the muscles for movement and activity. It also dilates the blood vessels going to the heart, so we get more blood flow to the cardiac muscle. And it causes vasoconstriction in the viscera. Vasoconstriction in the viscera is important to help bring the blood pressure up so there is enough pressure to push blood to the skeletal muscle and the cardiac muscle. As we saw before, epinephrine also increases the heart rate and it increases the contraction strength so we get more cardiac output and that increased cardiac output is going to help increase the blood pressure as well. A different hormone that helps to regulate what's going on with vasomotion is angiotensin II. Angiotensin II is a hormone that's activated by events happening in the kidneys. Angiotensin II is not produced or released by the kidneys. It's activated in response to what's going on in the kidneys. What happens is that when your kidneys detect low blood pressure, that's a problem because it means you're not going to be filtering enough blood through the kidneys and you could have an accumulation of wastes in the blood. So when the kidneys detect low blood pressure, they need to do something about it. What your kidneys do is they release the hormone renin. Renin from your kidneys converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensinogen is a molecule that's released by your liver that just floats around in your blood all the time, just not doing anything, until renin converts it into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 circulates through your blood until it gets to your lungs. In your lungs, there's an enzyme called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, that converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a really powerful hormone. It has a number of effects. Um, for our purposes, the most important is the fact that it causes a lot of vasoconstriction. And that vasoconstriction throughout the body increases peripheral resistance to increase the blood pressure. It also stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. And increasing the sympathetic nervous system activity also raises the blood pressure. Angiotensin II also causes increased production of antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. Antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone are both hormones that we're going to cover more when we get to the kidneys. And while they work with different mechanisms, they both have the effect of increasing the amount of water that your kidneys save. So you save more water in the body, you make less urine so that you're retaining blood volume and that helps to keep your blood pressure up. And angiotensin II also causes the sensation of thirst. When you feel thirsty, you drink, and when you drink, that raises your blood pressure, and that helps bring your blood pressure up. So angiotensin II actually regulates blood pressure through a number of different mechanisms, by regulating your blood volume, by regulating your cardiac output, and by regulating the total peripheral resistance.